I'm John Viventi uh, from uh, Duke University, and he'll be telling us about flexible electronics for neural interfaces. John. Great. Thank you very much, Kurt, for the invitation to talk here. Um, apologize my voice goes out. Uh, I've been sick, so hopefully we'll get through this. Um, so I want to talk about some of the work we're doing in my lab on how we can scale up to record from these very dense thousand-channel, multi-channel arrays. Um, and so a little bit about what is the trade-off we're facing, and that is, uh, as Shadi just mentioned, we can record from large areas with these clinical arrays that cover eight by eight centimeters or more. Um, we can have low resolution sampling over these large areas. Uh, but what we really like to achieve is having high resolution recording um, from the entire brain. And so this is an example of a Utah array. We can get nice high resolution recording, but from very limited areas in the brain. And the challenge here is that this doesn't fit very well with the way our brains work. We have 12 million neurons underneath each one of these one centimeter electrodes. So we'd like to be able to sample at this really fine spatial scale over large areas. And the limitation preventing us from doing this is really wiring. We can't pack more than about 1,000 wires inside someone's head when really we need tens of thousands of channels. Even 100 wires is actually quite challenging. Um, so just to sit, get an idea of spatial scale, the things we'd like to sample are on the order of these large cortical areas and things like the Utah array only give us very limited coverage. Uh, and so we're interested in the question of what's happening in the brain in epileptic uh, tissue. What, what are the sig microscale signals that give rise to seizures in patients with epilepsy? And so some of my colleagues have mapped the surface of the brain in limited senses and limited scales with millimeter scale electrodes. Uh, for example, these hybrid electrode arrays that include both microwires and macro electrodes. And they found things like micro seizures. These are events that look like clinical macro scale seizures, but are occurring on a single microwire electrode and aren't, aren't observed even a millimeter away. Um, other events like micro periodic epileptiform discharges and high frequency oscillations. And so there's all this fine scale activity occurring in the brain that we're not able to capture with our current clinical tools. So we'd like to be able to scale up to be able to sample large areas of the brain at very high resolution. However, this requires thousands of electrodes, and we need a way of combining those electrodes together using thousands of electrodes down to a much smaller number of contacts. We need devices that are extremely flexible to give us access to all of these complicated spatial geometries that are within the brain, and we need to sample at very high sampling rates with low noise. And so we started working on this a long time ago on how do we use flexible and stretchable electronics developed by John Rogers Group to allow us to build multiplexed arrays that can sample from thousands of contacts without requiring thousands of wires. So one of our first devices uh, back around 2011 uh, sampled from 360 electrodes uh, with 500 micron pitch between contacts. And because we can integrate transistors at each contact, we are able to sample all of this activity using 39 external connections. And so how we do this is we incorporate multiplexing, which combines signals directly at the source in the sensor. The same idea is what happens inside your digital camera. You have millions of pixels, but you don't need millions of external wire connections. Each pixel has local electronics that combine the signals at the source. And so for the, in this case, we have every electrode in a given column shares a single output wire. And then we have a row select line that runs across the array that we turn on and off to sample the activity in a given row. And if we cycle through all these rows quick enough, then we can reconstruct all the activity in the array. And so we did this in an acute demonstration. This is in an animal model. Uh, with an induced seizure. And so now we're looking at the raw voltage from 360 electrodes that um, capture activity during a seizure. This is a, has been slowed down 18 times. And so at the bottom is the average of all 360 electrodes. And so in this centimeter scale air of brain where we currently have only one electrode contact, there's all this rich spatial activity occurring during this seizure that we're not able to capture with our existing clinical tools. Okay, so this technology is really interesting. We're gonna get back to how, what have we been doing with this. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three different things briefly. Um, we're gonna talk about some new electrode arrays we're developing using liquid crystal polymer. Um, I think this is an interesting material for developing electrode arrays for long-term use. Um, 
neural, we're going to talk about new, new things we've developed with our multiplexed arrays that we're calling neural matrix arrays. And then finally, a little bit of human translation, how we're starting to bring this technology um, into the operating room and into the clinic. So first, I'll talk a little bit about liquid crystal polymer arrays. And so we've, we looked at two different kinds of thin film electrode arrays. We fabricated the same design using multiple manufacturing partners. Uh, and what we wanted to do was optimize how can we make thin and flexible electrode arrays that are low cost and also long term reliable. Um, and so we looked at a more traditional polyimid array, which has two layers of polyimid and gold electrode material. Um, and then liquid crystal polymer, which um, is really interesting because it is thermally formed, thermally bonded. That is, under intense heat and pressure, the two layers of LCP fuse together to form a single layer, which should prevent delamination over long-term implants, which has been a problem with traditional polyimid arrays. And so how do we test? So these devices we made are designed for use in rats, for chronic implants, and because we're leveraging uh, large-scale, flexible printed circuit board manufacturing, we're able to make these things for about $10 each. Um, in large quantities. So how do we test devices? We take our electrode arrays and we do soap testing. We put them in saline at 60 degrees Celsius. That, this accelerates the aging process by about five times. And we look at impedance and how many electrodes are still working over, over, many, uh, uh, over a long period of time. And so what's been interesting about LCP is that we don't see any, any evidence of delamination in our devices. This is a device that's been soaked for 231 days at 60 degrees Celsius, versus we've had some polyimid devices that delaminate in as little as, 60, uh, as nine days, and some that eventually delaminate in 191 days. And so we see a lot of variability in polyimid devices. Sometimes they work great. Um, and sometimes they delaminate over a very short period of time. So we haven't seen any of our LCP devices delaminate, and typically all of our soak testing has been limited by our soak testing setup failing before the electrodes. So how do we validate this in vivo? We then took these devices and implanted them in rat auditory cortex. And here we have a canonical experiment where we are recording evoked responses to auditory stimulation. And if our electrodes work well, we expect to be able to observe single trial auditory evoked responses to different sounds played at different frequencies. And we should be able to decode which sound the animal heard um, to give us a measure of the information content we're capturing from our devices. And so this is an example of what we capture from 64 channel arrays. Um, this is evoked activity from different auditory stimuli in our animals. This is under anesthesia, and so we see different spatial patterns of activation depending on which frequency we present. And so now if we take this and if we take the evoke response we capture at a given electrode and we look at the response we get for a given frequency, so this is an example of across multiple trials, we see an evoked potential. We can now treat, plot that evoked potential as a color and we can look across multiple different auditory stimulation frequencies, and we see that this electrode has a preferred, <coughs> preferred response frequency. And then it tends to respond to these middle frequencies. <coughs> we can do this across multiple stimulation amplitudes, and we can do this across all of our electrodes and build a preferred frequency map and that is, what is the best frequency for activating this area of primary auditory cortex? And so this is what the response looks like across all the electrodes in our array. And then finally, we can compare this to intra previously published intracortical measurement maps and show that we can get basically the same kind of evoked response data and tonotopic organization in the auditory cortex from our surface arrays versus uh, intracortical measurements that are made one measurement at a time and moving across the cortex. So this is great validation. We also did decoding so we can feed in information from our evoked responses into a classifier and make predictions about on new data about what sound the animal heard. And under pentobarbital anesthesia, we can do this with almost 100% accuracy, and that is we can, we can predict exactly what sound the animal heard across 13 different sounds. Um, under different anesthesias, we get different responses, and then, of course, we get lower accuracy in awake animals that are freely behaving. Okay, so we're able to do this in short-duration implants and acute measurements. We wanted to look at long-term recording stability with these LCP arrays, 
And so we implanted them chronically in five rats over the course of a year. And we looked at signal quality over time. And so we looked at, we see stable evoked responses across our electrode arrays. But we also think that this is not a full measure of recording quality because we've seen electrodes that have failed that still record an evoked response. So we look at a couple different things. We look at electrode impedance. We see a characteristic increase in, imp in impedance over the course of the first 30 days of implantation. And then long term, we see a gradual decrease in impedance over time. Uh, we don't think this is a function of the electrode impedi changing its impedance because in our soak tests, we don't see this impedance decrease um, ever over the course of an equivalent of five years of soak testing. We look at chronic decoding in these animals over the course of a year of implantation. We see an initial decrease in initial increase in error or a decrease in accuracy in the first 30 days. And then we see a pretty stable decoding accuracy over the rest of the duration of the implant. So we then took this technology, these electrode arrays, and we scaled that up to a larger channel count to 244 electrodes. We designed an implant to go into non-human primates with our collaborator Bijan Pesseron at NYU. So we took this electrode array, we also embedded it into an artificial dura. And so the idea here is this artificial dura is transparent. It also has holes for placing individual micro electrodes that are mo individually movable. And each of the electrodes has a pitch of 750 microns between contacts. This was designed to go into a chamber system. <coughs> right. That has 32 individually movable microelectrodes so that we can record from inside the cortex as well as the surface at the same time. And so we've been using this to validate, um, to do recordings from motor cortex with our collaborators. Um, and they're just starting to collect data with this. Um, well, they have a, a large amount of data from this that we're hoping to publish soon. And uh, we should be updating more on this soon. Okay, so to get back to our neural matrix arrays, we now have developed a flexible electrode platform for validating technology. We wanted to get back to how do we use our active technology to scale to thousands of channels in chronic implants. So when we first demonstrated the technology for high density electrode, multiplexed electrodes over almost 10 years ago now, um, the challenge was how do we make long-term implants that survive? We haven't, didn't have an encapsulation strategy that would allow us to have powered electronics with a very thin encapsulation that would survive very long-term in the body. It took us about eight years to solve this. Uh, we finally think we have solved this. Um, we've come up with two changes to our electrodes that have allowed them to last long-term. The first was incorporating capacitive sensing and that is we completely encapsulate the, the device with a thin, flexible encapsulation material. And then we sense electrical signals you, through that encapsulation using a capacitive electrode. And so our electrode directly couples to the gate of our transistors that amplify the signal, amplify the current of the signal, and provide voltage buffering. Um, and then we sense neural signals from the brain through a, th a thin layer of thermally grown silicon dioxide. So this has also been an innovation that allowed us to have long-term implants. We tested a number of different encapsulation strategies. Um, we'll just summarize three of them here. So a really common um, alumina, paralene, multi-layer stack up, <clears throat> um, and LCP. We compared a thick layer of LCP. And all these materials have pinhole defects that eventually form over time and allow current to flow and basically cause the implant to fail. Uh, thermally, <coughs> excuse me. Um, thermally grown silicon dioxide is the only material we found that would survive long term in the body that would allow us to do these kinds of chronic recordings. And so just about a micron of thermally grown silicon dioxide we found can last, we project to last about 60 years in chronic implants um, in, at body temperature. Okay, so we used this, these two innovations to make active electrodes. Uh, first, a simple array that's an eight by eight uh, uh, grid that has the same geometry as our passive LCP arrays. And then we implanted it again in rat auditory cortex. And we made some comparisons between our passive electrode arrays. We were able to record auditor um, auditory evoked responses from passive arrays and very similar 
data from our active arrays or neural matrix arrays that shows auditory evoked responses that are, have similar properties, similar amplitudes, um, and similar um, signals. That was an example of the experiment in an acute preparation. These are the active arrays. And it's an example movie of an auditory evoked response from an 8 kilohertz tone played to the animal. And we were able to do decoding as well. We have similar decoding accuracy from our active electrodes <coughs> to our passive devices, about 68% decoding accuracy. Um, and we see similar signal-to-noise ratios, although our signal-to-noise ratios are slightly decreased because we have more noise in these devices. Because they incorporate university-fabricated transistors, they have higher noise floors, um, and so our overall signal-to-noise ratio is decreased. In our chronic implants, we were able to see auditory evoked responses out to a year uh, of recording. Uh, we had five animals run, um, varying durations over about a year, and we were able to see pretty stable evoked responses that were above zero dB over the course of a year. Um, we had one device fail. We think that was actually due to the connectors and not the implant, uh, but most of them basically ran as long as, as the head caps remained implanted. We were able to continuously record from these devices. So we then scaled this technology up to a thousand channel array. This incorporates the same encapsulation and multiplexed electronics um, designed to be implanted chronically in a monkey. Um, the same thermal silicon dioxide encapsulation strategy. And now with 92 external connections and 250 micron pitch between sites. And so we're able to record evoke responses in our non-human primates. Uh, from all 1,008 channels with good yield. Um, and we're still looking at some more of this data, but some examples that we're able to get signals from these devices. So now the question is, what kind of spacing do we actually need? We can go quite a bit finer than 250 microns. And so we're looking at fabricating simple passive electrodes with varying electrode contact sizing and electrode contact spacing in order to address the question, um, what kind of electrodes do we need? What kind of size and pitch to fully capture the information available from the surface of the brain? <coughs> um, okay, so one way we've started to figure out what is really sufficient to fully capture the local field potential activity from the surface of the brain is to borrow some things from geospatial statistics uh, where we're doing prediction or, or kriging from of unseen field potential between sites. So that is, if we leave out half of our electrodes and we try to predict the ele the, those electrode contacts from every other electrode, how fine of a pitch do we need to guarantee that we can predict the local field potential with less than 10% error 95% um, of the time? So we're setting arbitrary um, accuracy requirements um, and so what kind of pitch do we actually need to be able to predict all of the local field potential between our electrode sites without inducing too much error? And so we've analyzed this for what, rat implants, non-human primates, and in humans. Um, and what we found is that this is also a function of signal-to-noise ratio in our implants. But for our electrodes, we've seen that we need at least some millimeter sampling for gamma band activity and higher frequency in humans. So now we can start to set bounds and rationally design the pitch of our electrodes in order to capture local field potential activity. Now, why would you want to necessarily go any, any smaller than this? Well, our group and others have looked at recording spikes from the surface of the brain, um, originally published by Dion Kodahali. So if we have small enough electrodes spaced close enough together, we may be able to capture spiking activity from the surface of the brain. Uh, we've also seen this with our electrodes. Um, and so, we're, so that's one reason why we're interested in scaling even further than might be needed for the local field potential activity. So in order to scale up for that, we've now taken our neural matrix electrodes. We're starting to fabricate them uh, commercially, so we have lower noise, and we are able to scale to finer pitches. So we've made a design that incorporates 4,000 electrodes with 50 micron pitch in the same form factor we previously had 64 electrodes by using commercial CMOS. And the goal here is to use a lower 
uh, an older CMOS process so we can make these chips at lower, lower cost, uh, thin them to make them flexible, and use a thin polymer cable to bring out about 18 external connections for chronic implants in rodents and other animals. We're also working with Ken Shepard's group at Columbia to scale up even farther. Uh, as a part of the NESDI program in DARPA, we're making electrodes that have 65,000 contacts and 25 micron pitch, and the goal is to have them be fully wireless and chronically implantable. Their final goal is to be able to do a million electrodes that are both recording and stimulating, um, and to deliver wireless data and power to develop a visual prosthetic device. Okay, so for human translation, I'll mention a little bit what we're working on. is that we've tried to bring some of our um, li liquid crystal polymer arrays into the operating room um, because we know these are all biocompatible materials that are safe, that we can use <coughs> um, for short duration recordings in the operating room and eventually in the epilepsy monitoring unit for up to 30 days. And so we've developed an implant system that allows us to do recordings and place these devices quickly in the operating room then incorporate recording electronics and the flexible electrode arrays. Uh, so we're using 244 channel and 1,000 channel arrays in, this, in, this, in these implants. A uh, little bit of what this procedure looks like. The neurosurgeons uh, take the sterilized module, remove a cap, plan, lower it down onto the surface of the brain, um, and then do recordings from the cortex in patients that are undergoing epilepsy surgery. So a little bit about what we were able to capture. We were also capturing auditory evoked responses um, in these patients. And so this is some spectrograms of activity during word and non-word tasks. Um, so we're working on this in collaboration with Greg Kogan, um, who's a neuro neuroscientist in the Department of Neurosurgery at Duke. So just to summarize, we're working on thin film flexible electrode arrays using liquid crystal polymer, um, as well as high density multiplexed arrays, we're calling neural matrix arrays. Um, and then tr working to translate these technologies into human use. And by incorporating active electronics inside the array, we can then now make thin devices, relatively thin, 25 microns thick, then incorporate up to 65,000 electrodes uh, with as pitch as fine as 25 microns. And we can sample each of these electrodes at up to 10 kilosamples per channel. Um, we're goal is to use a small number of wireless wires in these devices for external connections and to ultimately make them fully wireless um, and fully implanted. So I'd like to acknowledge support for this work from, from DARPA, Aero, NSF, um, the Cure Foundation, and the NIH. Um, and of course, all the students that did all this work, uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, and research scientists that make all this possible. All right, thank you. Thank you, John, that was great work. Um, so questions? Hey, Jonathan, thanks for the nice talk and, and powering through. You're doing, doing well despite being sick. Um, so um, one of the issues that, that tend to arise with these capacitive uh, interfaces is this issue of reliability versus impedance, right? So you showed that for 900 nanometers, I think you said, mm -hmm. you got 60 years equivalent lifetime. But at 900 nanometers, you probably have too high of impedance, depending on kind of what your, what your target application is, of course. And so you'd probably want a little thinner. And so how do you balance that, that, that trade-off uh, for you know, the various kind of applications that you're looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, um, one, one benefit we have is that the electrode goes directly into an amplifier into the gate of a transistor. So we don't have long traces or any kind of parasitics. But yes, 900 nanometers limits the amount of um, the size of the contacts. So we can't decrease to very small contact sizes. In order to go smaller, we've also worked on a through-hole technology. So how do we get through the thermal, thermally grown silicon dioxide um, to do a direct electrical sensing as well um, with also increased reliability? So we've published some of that. I didn't, didn't include it here, but. Um, so we are still working on it. So if you really want to get down to these really small contact sizes, then you need a different strategy. Um, we also need to show that that is chronically reliable. But if you want sort of hundreds of micron, 200 micron contacts, um, then, yeah, then you can do that with 900 nanometer with uh, silicon dioxide. 
Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, so along that route, if you're going to like these larger uh, uh, electrodes, and you're doing active multiplexing, then you only have the 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 one or a couple transistors. They have finite noise and gain mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And so, how do you then balance the the noise of that? Given that you have this this bigger electrode, and you're probably looking at field potentials rather than individual <laughs> units. I'm I'm guessing. I don't know, but. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. So far, we haven't seen any difference between contact size and the signals we acquire um, between in the LFP, between 20 microns to 200 microns. Uh, we also see spiking activity with 200 micron electrodes. That's sort of interesting. I mean, we're trying to analyze. There should be a difference if we see a different spike activity from different contact sizes. But other people have seen spiking activity at up to 250 micron diameter electrodes. Um, and then, yeah, noise. Um, we are optimizing the transistor design to be as low noise as possible to get us to the realm of the noise levels that our um, existing devices have. Um, for example, neural pixel arrays. So we're targeting that kind of noise level by just making transistors as big as possible. What, what is that noise level? Integrated? So about single digit microvolts, so five to 10 microvolts, we think we can achieve um, with simple, really simple circuit strategies for multiplexed electrodes, including all of the aliased noise. Right, so the, mul the biggest noise source is the fact that there's no anti-aliasing, right? So, um, so we think even including that, that lack of anti-aliasing, we can get below 10 microvolts total, total noise at each contact um, in simulation so far. But yeah, hopefully we'll see that in cool. the future. Thank you. Thanks. Some more questions? John, thanks for your presentation. Just wanted to ask if uh, you can comment more on the impedance variability for the LCP. You had one plot over time across animals, and uh, on the y-axis, that seemed to be quite a bit of range. If you can get some more uh, clarity on that. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, the impedance from manufacturing is pretty consistent. We have yields 95%. Um, they're typically, these are, these are the gold electrodes. We haven't done a study with platinum iridium. We also have a contact platinum iridium contacts. Um, but the impedances in soak testing seem to be pretty stable. In chronic implants, they, um, <coughs> they do rise and then fall again. Um, it seems like there's a lot of variability. There's also a lot of contacts in, in that plot. So, um, yeah, there's, there's some variability. I mean, we see much lower impedance with our platinum iridium electrodes. Uh, those are about one kilo ohm at one kilohertz. Um, but yeah, we haven't done chronic implants of those, those devices yet. But great point. Hello, uh, nice talk. Then I have a, a, a little concern about chronic implants though. You say that it can uh, last, uh, well, like more than 63 years once it's inserted, right? But uh, uh, human beings are carbon-based creatures. But silicium dioxide is a foreign material for us. That have you ever done the chronic and acute toxicity? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we have looked at silicon dioxide does uh, degrade. So that's what's really limiting the lifespan of these devices is the silicon dioxide does get dissolved away over time. And it, it forms a biocompatible uh, uh, pro byproduct after the reaction. We're hoping to slow that dissolution rate further by adding capping layers that, that, that limit the degrade degradation. The silicon is also biocompatible. It, it does dissolve as well over time and uh, it does get resorbed. Um, we think it will all be biocompatible long term. We've, we've done some studies on this with dummy devices. But yes, we do need to do these tests on full active devices that include all of the working circuitry to verify biocompatibility before they get, before we go into humans with these um, implants. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yep. So it sounds like from, a great talk, a great talk. It sounds like from your talk and from Shadi's talk, um, as you guys collect lots of this data, there's, there appears to be these interesting patterns of wave-like phenomena trying to understand. It sounds like there are unique opportunities to develop fun signal processing paradigms to disambiguate some types as compared to others, what's a consequence of chance, et cetera. Are those active efforts that you guys are trying to do? Or? 
Yeah, that's a great question. We really need ways of better understanding this data because right now clinicians that are making surgical decisions and evaluating patients for epilepsy surgery are looking at raw traces on the screen. And so they can do that for about 100 channels, but when we start giving them thousands of channels, there's just no way. They're not, they're not going to be able to sort through this data. So it needs to be analyzed and presented in a way that's more of a two-dimensional, more of a heat map, more than something that's already done feature extraction um, and turn this data into a, a form factor that people can understand. We've looked a little bit about that, but we definitely need a lot of help there in terms of how are we going to boil down this sea of data into what is actually relevant for these clinical decisions. I have a question too. So, um, so you showed uh, the spatial resolution with some of your arrays is about a millimeter and you did this versus metric uh, means for testing that. Uh, but then you have arrays with 25 micron spacing. Mm. Um, so uh, I guess to what extent would be limited by uh, the biophysics or, or, or in volume conduction um, versus better electrodes, lower impedances, and, and so what would you get them from 25 micron on, on the surface of cortex? Right, that's a great point. Yeah, so I, I, I didn't mention that. So the benefit of going to really small spacing, the opposite of um, <clears throat> what we've come with with this creating statistic is that you can do um, spatial averaging or spatial filtering to decrease noise. So as we scale to these really small electrode spacings, we increase noise in our measurements uh, from the instrumentation. Um, and we're vastly oversampling the local field potential at that point. Um, it's on the order of half millimeter, maybe less. But we can recover, we can denoise that spatial signal to capture local field potential um, with much better signal to noise ratio because we're oversampling it. Uh, and then we can, well, we can look at, at units, basically. The goal is then, the only reason to go to that kind of fine pitch, I think, is to record um, spiking activity, multi-unit activity from the surface of the brain. So for designing clinical devices that we don't yet know what to do with that multi-unit activity, then I think probably in the order of hundreds of microns is sufficient um, as long as you have good signal to noise ratio. So the required spatial resolution is a function of your signal to noise ratio. So if you have poor signal quality, you can overcome that by spatially oversampling. So with a 25 micron uh, pitch and also non-contact capacitive sensing, would it be sufficient to, um, yeah. to get spike resolution? That's a challenge, yeah. I don't know if non-contact, maybe. That's, uh, that's very challenging at that spatial scale. Um, so we're going to try to do strategies where we do uh, through hole and, and contact electrodes, Faradaic electrodes, um, to, in order to get to that really fine pitch. But if we're designing devices for a medium scale pitch, I think the capacitive sensing allows us to um, not have as many challenges with long-term implants. Good. Well, let's thank um, John again. Thank you.